my presentation will, in some respects, take an aspect of what Sandy was speaking about uh, and then seek to expand it a little bit. And that's particularly to talk about sex and the place of sexuality in our understanding of what's going on in the current debate and in our response to it. A belief that was held by virtually all human beings for centuries has been rebranded as bigotry, something that no longer may be expressed in polite circles. That belief is that marriage is something that occurs between a man and a woman, or between a man and many women. The idea that marriage is a union of opposite sexes. This was once seen as a perfectly normal point of view. Now, in the historical blink of an eye, it has been denormalised, and with such ferocity and speed that anyone still brave enough to express it runs the risk of being ejected from public life. Does it feel that way to you? <clears throat> Does it feel like it's changed in the blink of an eye? It does, doesn't it? It feels like one of those bouts of ferocious collective madness that sweeps through a society that seems to come from nowhere. But of course, they rarely come from nowhere. And in this case, it's not so hard to see where the seemingly sudden revolution has come from, and that's what I want to dig into over the next few minutes. It has its roots in another seemingly sudden revolution that took place about 50 years previously, the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Now, I was born in the 1960s. I was just a little young to have much to do with the wild and crazy life of the 60s. But by all accounts, it felt rather similar to what's happening now, a seemingly sudden change of attitudes and behaviour that swept through Western society. The standard narrative of the 60s, of course, is that the stuffy, repressed, oppressive attitudes to sex that prevailed, especially in that most dreadful of decades, the 50s, were cast off and that people now felt free to explore their sexuality, to have lots of sex with whoever and whatever they wanted and to become more authentically themselves as they did so. Now, it's, it's always hard to know how accurate these big sweeping summaries and narratives are of cultural movements, especially as that period recedes into history. But there's no doubting that something changed in the 60s quite rapidly and radically. For example, in the early 1950s, around 5% of girls 16 and under reported having had sexual experience or had sexual intercourse. By 1973, that figure was 30%. By 1989, nearly 60% of American high schoolers professed to having had sexual intercourse by the age of 16. That's a massive change in a very short space of, uh, uh, span of time. And it's not just behaviour, but attitudes changed also very rapidly. In 1965, nearly 70% of Americans under 30 said that premarital sex was always or almost always wrong. Just seven years later, that figure had dropped to below 25% in just seven years. And by 1990, in Britain, the comparable figure was down to 6%. What would it be now? The judgment that premarital sex is always or almost always wrong. What drove this sort of change? As Sandy mentioned, no doubt the, the availability of the contraceptive pill is widely credited as having a tipping point effect. But of course, this sudden revolution too was the result of a long, profound set of changes in Western culture, of a long, slow, inexorable revolt against the Christian worldview going back for more than 100 years. And if you want to trace uh, the contours of that revo revolt, um, Philip Jensen and I wrote a little book called Pure Sex, which traces it, uh, if you'd like to chase that through. The sexual revolution of the 60s uh, culminating as it did in this long, after this long period of, of revolution against Christian viewpoints, was really a reimagining of what sex was, of what good sex was and bad sex was. And to understand what happened in the 60s and how it lay behind what is ha happening today, we need to ask this question, what is sex anyway and how has its definition changed? Now, I have five children. You'd have thought I'd have figured out what sex is by now. Um, <laughs> But if you really want to understand what anything truly is, especially what makes it good or what makes it bad, you need to ask at least two questions. 
you need to ask what kind of thing this thing is, what are its features, what are its characteristics, how would you describe it? And you need to ask what it's for, what its purpose is, especially if you want to know how to use it well or rightly. So a screwdriver, for example, you say, what sort of thing is a screwdriver? It's a tool or implement. It has a moulded plastic handle. It has a steel shaft. It's only got some form of head on the end. That's the kind of thing a screwdriver is. What's a screwdriver for? Well, it's for driving in screws, which is why it's called a screwdriver. It's for driving in screws. How this thing is used, what it's for, which of course is all bound up in its design and its shape and its nature, is derived from the manufacturer who had an end in mind for that screwdriver. So what kind of thing is sex and what is sex for? Well, that would depend on who made it, wouldn't it? In fact, that would depend on whether it was made at all. And that's the thing. The understanding of sex that undergirded and prevailed uh, in the West for many hundreds of years was based on a biblical understanding that sex was made, that it was a created thing, and that its nature and purpose derived from the purposes of the one who had created it. Now, Sandy's touched on this very briefly already, but the kind of thing that sex is, according to the Bible, is the erotic physical union of a man and female, a man, sorry, a man and a woman, a male and female, female human, usually involving genital intercourse. That's what sex is, the kind of thing it is. And its purpose in the Bible is the mutual self-giving and pleasure that cements a covenanted relationship between a husband and a wife and that leads naturally to the conception of children. So like everything in God's creation, sex is created or ordered or oriented, oriented towards love. Sex is an agency or, or an instrument of love. Love for the other person to give them pleasure and to give yourself to them and love for the children who are loved into existence and given life. And we see this positive picture of what sex is and what it's for in the many descriptions and uh, passages that, uh, that touch on the subject, both in the early chapters of Genesis and in, in Proverbs and, of course, in Song of Songs. But we also see it in the prohibitions or descriptions of what constitutes bad or wrong sex because they violate either the kind of thing sex is or its purpose, what it's for. So sex between a man and a woman outside of marriage, say adultery, is in accordance with the kind of thing sex is, that is, it's sex between a man and a woman, but it's against what sex is for. It's a violation of the purpose for which sex was created. In fact, it's completely counter to the purpose for which sex is created. Rather than bonding together a man and a woman, a husband and a wife in love, adultery splits that bond apart uh, in the most painful way imaginable. It's destructive of a marriage rather than gluing it together. But sex between two men or sex between two women or between a person and an animal <coughs> violates not only the purpose of sex but it also violates the kind of thing sex is, its nature, its character. And this is why I think, especially in the Old Testament, there's such strong language in the Torah to condemn those forms of sexual sin. It's like a screwdriver with no handle or no head or a screwdriver made of styrofoam. It's, it's perverse. It's not really a screwdriver. But of course, we quite like perverse. We're good at it. Perverse comes naturally to us. We have a genius as a species for using God's good creation wrongly and perversely because we want to, because we think it will be good for us, because it feels like fun. And we have this idea, very deep-seated, that we know better and that the effect at some point down the track or, or immediately will be our pleasure and joy, whereas in fact it's most often our harm and destruction. And this, of course, really is the essence of sin as the Bible defines it, from Genesis onwards. Rebellion against the rule and the purposes of God, the creator, in a doomed quest to be masters of our own universe, to give it its own shape, to impose our own will upon it, to be wise and to rule and to do it our way. And it has always been this way. It has always been this way. We do it individually and, of course, we do it together. We create cultures. 
cultures that have relationships and norms and ideas and practices and artefacts and habits that express and embody and articulate and perpetuate this rebellious stance towards God and his purposes. And so down through history, we see human cultures in rebellion against God in the way they deal with all sorts of subjects, including sexuality. It was certainly the case in both the Old Testament, if you think of the sexual culture of the nations around Israel that they were to be distinct from. It's certainly the case in the New Testament, where all manner of debauchery and indulgence was common in the culture in which Christians were called out of to live differently. So we shouldn't deceive ourselves that People have basically all lived God's way till about 1963, and now it's all going to pot. We shouldn't um, fall, fall prey to the golden years uh, syndrome, the golden years fallacy, that somehow it was all better in the past. Every human culture down through the centuries has its own way of expressing and enculturating a rebellion against God and his purposes. We've always done it. How has our culture done this with regard to sex? What is sex in our culture? Well, it's the erotic physical union of one, two, or more beings, usually but not necessarily human, of any gender of which genital intercourse may or may not be involved. That's my attempt at a definition as broad and as uh, malleable as possible because that's what sex is in our culture. It's malleable. It's polymorphous. It's any and every erotic act that it is physically possible to devise. Sex has no specific shape or nature in our culture. It is not a created thing with a certain character. In that sense, there is no normal or natural in sex in our culture because it is not created. It is a physical act that we can play with and define as we see fit. In fact, the biblical idea of marriage is often criticised in our culture as a fake imposition on the naturalness of sexual expression of any kind freely and in all ways of having sex whenever, however, and with whomever we wish. But sex in our culture also has a redefined purpose. And this is the really big shift. Its redefined purpose is for me. It's for what I wish to achieve from it. It can be fun or profit. It can be for my self-expression or personal empowerment. It can simply be for pleasure. It can be for the formation or assertion of my identity. It can be for gaining power and keeping power over someone else, and so much more. The purpose of sex in our culture is to achieve one or more of these things for me that I feel are for my benefit. And if it does those things, then it is good and fine. And anyone who tries to stop me doing it is just one of those life-denying, sexually repressed, fundamentalistic wowsers who usually end up being the serial killer on SVU. In this culture, people of the same gender having sex with each other is perfectly normal and legitimate. It has to be because of how we have come to define and think about sex as a practice that we form malleably as we wish. It is just one other way that someone might utilise or express their sexuality, as we put it, as a means to personal happiness and fulfilment. Like the rest of the material world, it just is. It's just something that exists. And whatever meaning or purpose or significance that it has is that which we impose upon it ourselves. And so the seemingly rapid change of view on homosexuality is just the natural consequence of the seemingly rapid changes that took place in the 1960s. A new normal has established itself in which sex is redefined as the autonomous personal pursuit of pleasure, identity, experience and fulfilment on my terms. And this is why the ultimate faux pas today even worse than saying that you are against same-sex marriage is to say that homosexual sex is wrong and immoral. Of course, it is wrong and immoral. It, it was 50 years ago when most people in, cult, in our culture thought it was, and it remains so today, even though a larger number are now thinking that it isn't. Because its wrongness and immorality doesn't derive, derive from the majority view of how many people happen to vote in which opinion polls. Nor does it derive from the authority of religious officials or the church. It derives from the created nature of the world and of humanity created by the true and living God. But if you want to offend nearly everyone today, just say that, that homosexual sex 
is wrong. It's, it's horrific to the modern mind because it proclaims an idea that our society has been furiously rebelling against for the past 50 years, and that is that any form of sex might be classified as wrong or immoral. If I admit the possibility that one form, this form we're talking about, homosexual sex, might be wrong and immoral, then what does that mean for all the non-marital sex that I've been having for the last two decades? I'm speaking rhetorically there, by the way. That was, was, it's not a, it wasn't a confession. My wife is here in the front row. I just wanted to make that clear. Well, that brings us to how are we going to respond. If you're wondering where we are on our outline, I'm up to the bit that says rethinking our stance. How should we respond to this situation we find ourselves in, in our conversations and interactions? The first step is clarity, and I'm assuming that's why you're here tonight, and I'm glad you're here tonight. We have to be clear in our thinking. We have to be razor sharp in our thinking on this question, because what's happening at the moment is that two worlds are colliding. Two diametrically opposed worldviews are coming into direct conflict. They've been in conflict for a while, but as often happens, a particular issue brings it to a point where that conflict is very visible and unavoidable by everybody. The two worlds are one in which God the Creator gives shape and order to all that exists, including sexuality, in which sex is a certain kind of thing made by God and has particular purposes given to it by God, versus a, a world in which sex is simply a physical and, and psychosocial phenomenon that can take any shape we can invent and that we can invest with whatever character and purpose we wish. Now, clarity on this is vital because we mustn't underestimate just how much we as a Christian culture have been white-anted over the past four or five decades by the dominance of the opposing view and the way that it has seeped into every corner of our culture. Those of us who've grown up in the last, well, that's all of us who've been here in the last 50 years, have absorbed and imbibed a worldview and a conception of sexuality that today almost feels natural to us because it's just the air we breathe. It has become totally dominant. We find it a bit hard to get upset about sexuality outside of marriage, certainly as much as we used to. And as Sandy pointed out, the generation coming through that has lived this even more than, than those of us who are older have find it hard to persuade themselves emotionally that same-sex marriage or that gay sex might be wrong. We are no longer shocked because a new cultural normal has been established and is conveyed and represented and reinforced at all levels. And we need to realise that this is happening, that we are being enculturated every minute of every day. It's a, it's a Romans 12.2 moment for us as Christians in this culture. Do not, be do not be conformed to this world, says Paul, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. We need to wake up as Christians and realise that a battle is taking place here between two worlds. It's, of course, the same battle that's been raging for millennia. It's the battle between God's vision of this world and ours, between the spirit and the flesh, between the true and living God and the false gods that we manufacture. But we need to get this picture very clear in our minds. Well, then what? How do we respond? If we have this battle clearly in our minds, what sort of responses can and should we make? Well, I'm going to suggest uh, additional to Sandy's responses which uh, had more to do with how you might present a rational, reasonable argument against same-sex marriage in a public square context without referencing the Bible and biblical views, how you might have that water-cooler conversation in just 10 seconds. I'm going to talk uh, about a broader, deeper response, a, a response that is part of a conversation we might be having with friends and neighbours in our community over time. Not just about this specific issue of, of same-sex marriage and the legislation that's before Parliament, but how we respond as Christians within a hostile culture when we wish to both be holy and proclaim the word of God. And I'm going to suggest that we go to 1 Peter. In fact, if you want a practical step to take after tonight, after tonight something to do, it's always nice to go away with something to do, read 1 Peter three times prayerfully. That would be my uh, advice to you. And pray that God would write it on your heart because 1 Peter is a superb picture of a Christian community in an alien and hostile environment, in an idolatrous and immoral culture with the challenge of living and speaking in a context that is aggressive and difficult. 1 Peter is a wonderful book to read. 
And I'm just going to highlight three passages briefly from 1 Peter um, and from them give three particular kinds of responses that I think we can make as Christians uh, in this current context. And the first is from chapter 1 in 1 Peter. I've, I've thrown it up on the screen. Peter says, As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as a father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Peter says you've been ransomed and rescued from that futile, rebellious, unholy way of life to live that way, and so keep living that way. Keep your distinctiveness. That's what holiness means, of course, because it was in order for you to be distinctive, in order for you to stick out like sore thumbs, to stick out like lighthouses, that you were delivered out of the folly you were trapped in. So fear God, he says. Remember who it is who saved you and why. And be holy as he is holy. Don't cave in. Don't be conformed to the world around you. God saved you so that you would not. On this issue, friends, I suspect it won't be difficult to be distinctive. It'll still be hard. It'll still take some courage. It will take a fear of God as the judge of all. But I don't think we'll be short of opportunities. But we shouldn't fear those who are opposed to us either because God is on our side. In fact, fear is quite a theme in 1 Peter. If we skip forward to chapter 3, uh, after a, a, a passage that uh, is worth reading before this one as well, he says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honour Christ the Lord as holy. Fear pops up again here, this time as an encouragement not to back down. There will be plenty of people who oppose, but don't be troubled, Peter says. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Certainly don't fall back into the futility and folly from which you were rescued. Because God looks after his people. We can entrust ourselves to him. Because if he is for us, well, who can be against us? What's the worst that could happen? What could they do to us if God is for us? So don't be afraid, says Peter, but be prepared to speak up because that's what this passage then, of course, goes on to say. Always be prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behaviour in Christ may be put to shame. If the first form of response is, Fear God and keep being holy. Don't fear them, fear God and keep being holy. The second kind of response is that we must speak up. We must be prepared to offer a reason for the hope we have because to be one of God's holy chosen people, one of the royal priesthood, is to be a proclaimer. That's what Peter says in chapter 2, you'll probably remember. He made us his chosen people and made us a royal priesthood so that we might proclaim the wonders or excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. That's 2.9. And Peter wants them to be ready to speak and to give some thought as to how they're going to answer for the hope that they have, which I assume is why you've come tonight, to consider how it is I might answer when that conversation inevitably occurs. Given what we've seen tonight, I would say that your answer needs to have at least four components when you give your answer. I think you need to start at creation. I think you need to step back uh, one or two steps and talk about whether this world is created or not, whether there is meaning and purpose built into the created order or not, because that is, that is most likely what divides you from the person you're speaking to. You're on two different planets. You're on a created planet. They are almost certainly on an accidental planet without meaning or purpose or absolute values if they're a normal member of our culture. And it really helps to get this out into the open and to say that my attitudes and beliefs about sexuality, including homosexuality, are not, don't arise from bigotry or fear or personal repression or some bad experience I had or just a natural aversion to certain people or anything like that. They're rooted in the fact that I think this world is created. And I suspect you don't. And this is why our views diverge so wildly. 
We live on different worlds. I think our second response should be blasphemy. I'll tell you what I mean. (laughs) This is not just an accidental planet, of course. It's a planet in rebellion. It's a planet of false gods and of lies. It's a planet of idols. And as in the time of the New Testament, which is very much the same, the fundamental response to a false god or to an idol is to blaspheme them, to proclaim in their place the truth of the gospel, to point out the falsity and untruth of false gods and idols. That's what Paul did in Acts 17, of course, in Athens. Very thoughtfully, very engagingly, very cleverly, but unremittingly and scathingly, He pointed out how false and hollow their idols were and proclaimed to them instead the true and living God whose creation we all are and who has sent his son to die and rise from the dead as the ruler and judge of all. We need to come out and say things when the opportunity arises and when we can and when it's appropriate that our culture and our friends will regard as blasphemies. We need to be prepared to say quite openly that we believe that same-gender sex is wrong and immoral, that it's an offence to God, and that like all the other acts of rebellion against him that we all do, it cuts us off from God. Now, there are all sorts of excellent reasons being put forward today as to why same-sex marriage ought to be pursued in our parliaments, uh, and Sandy has outlined many of them very well and excellently, but we need not stop there, I don't think, nor should we dance around this point just because we don't want to be seen as that guy. You know, the appalling, bigoted, self-righteous guy. The dinosaur guy who believes in the Bible. But friends, if we proclaim the cross and resurrection of Christ and, and call on people to repent of their sins and put their faith in him, we're already that guy. And so we need to name the elephant in the room sometimes in our conversations. That same gender marriage is a perverse and wrong idea because same gender sex is a perverse and wrong idea and wrong behaviour, rather. Now, you may say, and rightly so, if, if we take this rather brave step in our conversations and declare homosexual or same-gender sex to be wrong and immoral, won't that put an insuperable barrier in the way of people coming to know Jesus? Now, of course it will, but it's perhaps better to think of it as, as identifying the barrier that is already there in them coming to know Jesus. Because there will be no coming to know Jesus without an acknowledgement and understanding of what sin is and what our sin is, whatever our sin is, and repentance of it. Of course, along with any declaration like that, that same gender sex is wrong, must come the third component of our conversation, and that is that the good news of Jesus is that we're all in the wrong. (laughs) That every wrong is paid for and every shame is cleansed. In other words, the current moment, just as the moment in 1 Peter was and every moment in Christian history has been, is a gospel moment. That's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to think gospel-wise about your conversations on these matters as on every matter. It's a chance to declare again how much we are all in the wrong with God, our creator uh, and our provider and sustainer, how much we all have our idols and our false gods, how we all take the good gifts of the creator but impose our own will upon them, and how we're all cut off from him as a result, and that that same loving creator has sent his son to crucify that rebellion and to die in our place and to rise to be king. That's our message. It's our fundamental message in every circumstance. It's the message we want to get to in every circumstance, whether it's privately or at work or in the public square. It's the message that is Christian. It's the Christian message. But notice there's a fourth component in this... um, in this verse that's also extremely important, and that's the way it's done. It's done, as Sandy pointed out, with gentleness and respect. This is John 8 in practice, isn't it? It's speaking the truth plainly and openly, but it's doing so without aggression or anger or hostility. It's doing it gently, kindly, respectfully, plainly, graciously. And this, I too, this too, I think, comes from a lack of fear. Aggressiveness, anger, hostility... Disrespect, these very often stem from our insecurities, from our fears, from our desire to distance the other and to put up walls between us and to hide behind our righteous, in our righteous place and to throw bombs across the parapets. But we have nothing to fear. There is nothing that anyone can do to us that amounts to anything at all. 
because our hope is in God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when you speak of the creator and when you blaspheme the false gods of this world and when you point people to the Christ who rescues us from them, do it calmly, do it graciously, do it gently and respectfully. And finally, the third response is expect to still be reviled all the same. Doesn't matter how calm you are, how polite, how polite and respectful and nice and gentle you are, you will be mistreated and you will suffer. And we must cast our anxieties on the God who judges justly. And I won't read this passage because our time is, is, it, is short, but you might like to jot this one down and read it at home. In fact, read all of chapter 4. It's fantastic. It's all about the fact that sufferings will come and we're blessed if they do but that we need to entrust our souls to our faithful creator. If we're faithful, and if we keep doing these things, then we will be noticed. We will resolutely refuse to join in the flood that's, uh, that's washing all around us, and we will be maligned for it, friends. That will happen. And we will keep blaspheming the idols of this age, speaking the truth of Christ in love, and we should keep entrusting ourselves all the while to the great and loving creator God who judges all things.